uh, freedom of religion. They don't really have speech. And I won't say I was arrogant, but I was always thinking in the back of my mind, well, my country has all these things. Uh, that's why we're, we're so much better uh, than uh, China, which is you know, currently still very much a uh, third world country, except in, in, in spots. And what I, I kind of slowly realized over time is those very same economic and personal liberties that I thought were so great were really being eroded and had, were, have been in erosion really not just for the last uh, you know, decade, but for quite some time. And I became very alarmed and started looking into uh, the, the whole situation with uh, spending. And uh, one day I was sitting in a, a skyscraper in Shanghai and I happened to click on a, a link to a book called What Has the Government Done to Our Money by a uh, Dr. Murray Rothbard uh, from the Mises uh, Institute. And I started reading it about, you know, what the government has actually done to the money over time. And uh, I was like, oh, my gosh, is this actually true? And uh, I started looking into it. And uh, the rest, as they say, is kind of uh, history. You know, I'm really interested in a little bit more of your experience there, working in business there in Shanghai. What did you learn? Because I'm sure you were involved in some very entrepreneurial activities there. Could you tell us a little bit more of the uh, activities that were happening there? Yeah, well, um, again, for for folks that might not be too familiar with China, uh, for anyone that lives over there, like the main cities like Shanghai, Beijing, and, and Hong Kong, really, those are quite a bit different uh, than the rest of China in terms of their development. And I was working in a uh, quote unquote uh, free trade zone in uh, Shanghai. And it was it was uh, quite an interesting experience to uh, see all of the uh, paperwork and regulations that uh, you know China had really kind of put upon uh, these businesses. And the interesting thing about China and, you know, some place like the USSR, which, you know, fell apart uh, 20 years ago, is that uh, China's kind of way, uh, from my perspective, uh, to kind of get through things was simply to just to have uh, foreigners come in, uh, create some goods and, and uh, ship them back out uh, and export them. And the problem with that is you don't really uh, generate any internal demand. And a lot of times you could even make the argument that, the people there uh, in like Shanghai and Beijing, it's unquestionably that their living, their living standards are improving quite a bit. But more than half the country, really about two-thirds of the country, are still peasant farmers. And from my travels there into the countryside, um, you know, it's, it's uh, extremely uh, pretty basic, you know, concrete walls, a little plot of land. And uh, that's what I think a lot of people don't quite realize is that, uh, you know, in parts, yes, you can easily be fooled as a, as a foreigner if you walk down, you know, the main shopping streets of uh, Shanghai and see all the development. But uh, when you get outside of those uh, zones that have kind of been developed, uh, it's it's certainly a completely different uh, China. Coming back to your campaign, running for Congress, it I think it would take a lot of courage to run for any position in government at this time. Uh, we have some strong headwinds coming here as a country, and I'd like to ask you what you see coming for the U.S. on the horizon and what you think our listeners should be preparing for and thinking about in the future here. Well, those are good questions, and you know, speaking for myself, the reason I, I came back is I didn't see enough people trying to step up and, and run against this uh, more or less this duopoly, or at least have the ideas uh, to try and, you know, get things uh, turned around for our country. And uh, what I what I think we're seeing, and it, I don't like saying it, but uh, I think what we're seeing is, is the transfer of wealth from, uh, you know, just the same as, you know, the, the British Empire collapsing. What we have now is this uh, American uh, economy that's coming apart, and uh, we're seeing the, the transfer of wealth out to other places. And I, I don't like to see that. Like when I was over in China, I did see a lot of things about how, the U.S. Uh, ex, uh, government exports jobs, and I, I didn't like what I saw. And I think it's very easy if you take a market-based approach to a lot of these economic issues to turn them around very quickly. The problem is that we've gone so far, and you know, we have uh, elected officials that believe that uh, you know, giving uh, you know more or less bribes or bailouts to banks and, and these large uh, corporate firms like Goldman Sachs. Um, are you know necessary and it's that's completely ridiculous like the taxpayers should not be paying uh, for those types of things and and if you want a list of things to do that to make it very very simple you just go to Karl Marx's uh, communist manifesto and 
And Karl Marx, you know, believe it or not, he's probably the most influential uh, economist uh, in, you know, Western history. Because if you read through his uh, communist, you know, the Ten Planks and the Communist Manifesto, a lot of them, uh, I would say most of them, are to some degree certainly installed here. And all you need to do, all you need to do to have prosperity is read through the Communist Manifesto and do the exact opposite. Uh, it, it's not like it takes, uh, you know, brain surgery or anything like that. But where where we are with this, uh, and not just Marxist thought, but uh, uh, Keynesian economic uh, thoughts, where you know you can plug all these things into an equation and come out with the, you know the price of rent in New York City six fr- months from now, which is pretty much just nonsense. Uh, what we need to get back to, and what people need to realize, is that uh, you know what's going on with the dollar is the current bubble. We had the stock bubble back in, uh, or the tech stock bubble about 10 years ago, then all that liquidity and excess credit generated by the Federal Reserve then flew into the uh, housing and mortgage markets. And now people are, you know, yeah, the economy is not doing very well. We have so many unemployed. Uh, but really the biggest bubble right now in my mind is the, the Treasury market and sovereign debt. And that's actually, when that goes, the, the problem with that is that is actually our, our currency as well. So there's a lot more serious consequences than it, like a certain sector falling. What we're looking at is uh, things kind of coming out from the entire, uh, you know, world economy. And uh, for, you know, listeners to prepare themselves, I mean, the, the, be- the biggest thing, and I guess the best thing I can recommend is, you know, study these things, like look around and, you know, not just, uh, you know, look at the price of gold or silver every day, but understand exactly, you know, what is money. And, uh, you know, prepare yourself because, uh, you know, certain things like, you know, having a little bit of uh, food around and all that in case something goes down because, you know, what's very apparent if you go back and read what a lot of the representatives in Congress were saying, like after the TARP banker bailout, was that, you know, everything was on the point of collapse. Like that's what these representatives honestly uh, believe. And the problem is if we, if we do have a banking crisis, it could get to be very rough. And when you go around and, and see things that happened in countries around the world, like, for instance, uh, Argentina in 2002, where you had a lot of these banks just close and, you know, people couldn't get their, their money out for a certain period of time. And uh, I don't want to see that happen to our country, but with the direction that our politicians are taking with their spending policies and uh, bailouts, that is, unfortunately, the direction that we're going. You know, I've had an interesting conversation with a number of our previous guests about the idea of waking up. And when it comes to looking at issues like the ones we're talking about, it's almost like watching the movie The Matrix and kind of waking up and coming out of the illusion and seeing things for what they are. And I feel like our audience... Our listeners, I've had a lot of folks come forward and speak to me about this. I've had friends and family share the same thing, that it's kind of a, it's a rude awakening uh, coming out of this long slumber. Um, and everything looks different. Uh, the TV looks different. Uh, political messages look different. And so I'd like to ask you, what are you seeing in terms of people waking up? Uh, if we're talking about residents in, in, in your district, if we're talking about uh, you know, other representatives that you communicate with, whether they're in a Democratic or Republican Party or an independent party. What are you seeing in this area? Sure. And, you know, I, I would say, like, the biggest change that I've personally seen myself when I, when I go around uh, door knocking, and when I go around a lot of times, like, you know, you can't just start talking with people about the Federal Reserve or, you know, Central Bank and all this stuff because they probably, a lot of them still don't really understand it. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that I uh, use as a euphemism for what's actually going on is all this money printing, and people kind of get that. They're being taxed uh, by all this money printing. But when I went around in, in 2009, even this was kind of missed by a lot of people, like, oh, you, you know, what do you mean, like, the government prints money, like, our, you know, our money is, is you know, people still kind of like myself thought the money was actually backed by something overall. And... Uh, and now after, like, that whole stimulus plan and, uh, you know, all these huge deficits that they've been running, it's been very apparent. So now when I go around and say, oh, you know, the government's just printing up money like crazy and, uh, you know, this needs to end, uh, a lot of people end up uh, agreeing with I ha- what I have to say. And I think that that's, uh, you know, something to be very optimistic about in the future, that if we can learn enough and spread enough, and, you know, there's things and tools like the Internet that didn't exist, you know, back in, you know, the 50, 40, even 10 years ago, 
in terms of getting information around extremely quickly. And you know, it's so important to have you know the ideas and to have a good discussion on what's going to uh, you know really save our society and, and lead to more prosperity in, in the future. But we must always remember that you know the ideas themselves are just as useless as the constitution under the the, the two parties right now. Like nothing will occur unless people are willing to get out there and actually do things. And uh, you know one of the other things that happen is. Uh, or that people can do is just you know talk to people, let people know kind of what's going on uh, with the government, if they under and if they understand sound money, just keep the message out there because the, the more people that wake up uh, now, the the better off we'll all be, uh, you know when uh, you know the the next uh, crisis or you know does occur. Jake, between now and election day. What are some milestones that you and uh, your campaign supporters need to um, be focused on? Well, I'll be in the first uh, uh, televised debate uh, here on uh, local uh, television on this Wednesday. And we'll be out there going and, and just pretty much trying to do flyer blitzes and, and that sort of thing all along. And what's been kind of funny is uh, when you look at the debates, like there's about 10 debates in, in the area. And at the, the first one, uh, I would actually I claim victory, and you know people can go back and look at look at the tape against the, the Democrat and the Republican I was running against. But the the second and third debates, which was pretty interesting, is I showed up, and both my competitors weren't even there. And uh, you know last last night there was a forum uh, that was held uh, locally, and I, I did attend, but I was in the crowd because I was actually barred from uh, debating. Uh, and uh, like I said, there's the major TV one is coming up on Wednesday, but the day after that is also another one that I've been barred from, <laughs> and uh, it, and all the others I've been invited to and will attend. But it's pretty interesting to see kind of like the uh, the reactions of this uh, system to a person that you know has ideas, and I try to express them as you know simply as possible because like for instance with jobs. Uh, you have these guys, you know, talking about, oh, let's do this spending plan here, let's create this federal jobs program here, and what they never realize is that government has nothing. Like they can't, government of itself has to take away from something to for, to give it out, they give out a handout, and what they don't realize is economically there is no net gain. And what you need to do, for instance, with the whole jobs and the whole economy, and why I'm so confident things could be turned around very quickly, is because it's very simple. You just look through all the tax laws, labor laws, and regulatory laws, and just ask yourself a question: You know, are these, will these uh, uh, discourage or encourage employment? And if they discourage employment, then we just need to either get rid of them or change them so that they aren't uh, as as harmful. It's it's very simple, the path that we need to go on a lot of these things. Uh, you know, with the money situation, you know, just stop printing it. <laughs> Uh, you know, stop funding all this deficit spending and, and balance the budget for, for once in our lives. Why were you barred from those debates, Jake? And along with that question, what are you learning here about the political process? Because it, you know, as some commentators have, have mentioned it to be kind of like a show business. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, well, it's interesting because uh, the, well, the excuses that both the places have actually given is uh, polling results, like too low on the polls and that sort of thing. Uh, but what's funny is, like, one of the debates, uh, the the major, uh, the the one uh, on television coming up, one that one out of the three ones on TV, I'm, I'm banned from. Uh, that one, they initially invited me, and then the incumbent started complaining about how he would never debate me and not show up on stage with myself, which you know is kind of funny that I'm getting all this attention <laughs> from uh, the incumbent and. What a lot of people don't realize is, you know, even just to get on the ballot as an independent takes a heck of a lot more work uh, than uh, these guys do. Like, they had to file a 1,000 signatures to get onto the ballot. I had to file over 7,000. So I have a lot more people that have, you know, signed a petition that says, you know, this guy should be on the ballot uh, than these, uh, you know, basically guys that just get political welfare. Like, just because they have a D or R beside their names uh, doesn't mean that they have the ideas to save the country. I mean, 